<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm starting from the top. This is Nick Lund from Maine Audubon, and welcome to the Climate Action Plan. Are we on track, tracking progress on climate change in Maine? I am honored to be joined by this a panel who hopefully reminds me to do things like record and is otherwise just very much on top of things in general. Um, and we're going to talk today about the progress made in the year and a half since the climate action was, uh, plan was passed in December 2020. Um, let me do some quick ground rules first. So uh, this is a webinar. That means we cannot see you or hear you out there. So if you have comments, um, please, or have questions especially, please type them in the Q&A box, which is found um, down along the bottom row. Um, if you have other comments, you can type them in the chat, which is what some folks have been doing so far. Thank you. Um, we're going to go try to go quickly. We have a lot to cover today, so we're going to go as quickly as, as we can and uh, hopefully conclude with enough time to take as many questions as possible. Um, again, we are recording it, and it will thanks to Anya, and we will keep have it available uh, online, hopefully this afternoon, if you'd like to share. Um, I think that's all for the technical things. Let me get started by introducing everyone. Um, I'm Nick Lunn, Advocacy and Outreach Manager for Maine Audubon. I'm joined by, I was joined moments ago, um, in our partner in setting up these three women. There she is, um, Nancy Smith from Gross Fire Maine, the executive director over there. Um, today's webinar is part of a series of three that we were doing over consecutive weeks. Um, next week, we have a panel with uh, Maine Youth for Climate Justice and the Maine Climate Table. Uh, about intergenerational issues with climate change. It's going to be a very interesting discussion. And then uh, towards the, on the 26th, we have a webinar uh, with the Governor's Energy Office and some other uh, businesses around Maine talking about uh, how to save money and save the planet by um, solar panels and heat pumps and weatherization, electric vehicles, all the things you can do um, to combat climate change at home. So I hope you join us for those two. And thank you, Nancy, for joining. Um, we also are joined today by Anya Wright, my savior, uh, the legislative and political strategist for Sierra Club. Hello, Anya. We have Jack Shapiro, the Climate and Clean Energy Program Director with the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Hi, Jack. My colleague, Eliza Donahue, Maine Audubon's Advocacy Director. Hi, Eliza. And last but not least, Kathleen Meal, Pol Director of Policy and Partnerships with Maine conservation voters. voters. Hello, Kathleen. All right, so I'm going to get started first by jumping into a little bit about uh, what this is. Just a reminder here, and let me get my thing all set up. Everybody see that? Great. So we are here to talk about the Climate Action Plan, which had its origins in the creation of the Maine Climate Council back in 2019. It itself had its origins in climate change, the thing that is uh, affecting the entire planet due to human actions. Um, in June of 2019, the governor and the legislature created the Maine Climate Council, which is an assembly of scientists and industry leaders, bipartisan local and state officials, and citizens. And the goal was really to figure out ways to reduce um, our emissions. Um, the, the state has uh, statutory requirements to re, uh, reduce our emissions by at least 80% by 2050. That's a big old number. Um, and 45% uh, by 2030, that is coming right up, 80% by 2050, and carbon neutrality by 2045. So we have some big goals in Maine, and we need a plan to achieve them. So that's what the Climate Council set out to do. Climate Council is a big deal. Um, there are working groups with about at least 250 members total um, coming together to develop this plan. And they separate it out into a host of different working groups to figure out different angles and uh, approaches. So that includes um, buildings and infrastructure, coastal and marine, community resilience planning, energy, transportation, natural working lands. And all of them were sort of helped out by a scientific and technical subcommittee, uh, which provided uh, support in those. This was largely happening through 2020. So here is a, a timeline of where we were going through. This is from 2020 here. Um, and long story short, there was all kinds of meetings, all kinds of efforts um, to develop the plan. And it was presented in December of 2020. Here it is. It's called Maine Won't Wait, a four-year plan for climate action. 
And it outlined a number of different strategies uh, to tackle climate change. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, here's just a brief overview to give you a summary. Um, it, they talked about how do we bring the future of transportation to Maine? How do we modernize our buildings? How do we drive innovation to reduce carbon emissions in industrial and our energy sectors? That was ways to sort of reduce our emissions. And then there are ways to sort of prepare for the impacts of climate change that, that, are, that are, are coming. And that's how do we um, build resilient communities, right? How do we prepare? How do we have climate ready infrastructure? And how do we protect our natural and working lands? These were all factors. And each of those had its own strategies and own um, various ways to achieve them. I'll stop my share here. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. There are legislative strategies, there are private sector strategies, there are administrative strategies. And um, there was a climate council meeting today that some, some folks may have attended, uh, where they laid out the host of stuff that is happening. And it was, by all accounts, a very impressive display of Maine acting quickly. Um, and so that's what we're going to cover today, uh, is how are we doing on that plan? And um, are we getting there? So without Further ado, um, I am going to get started there and turn it over to Mr. Jack Shapiro to talk about energy. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, really great to be here with uh, with you all. Thanks everyone to for for taking the time to join the call on such a such a beautiful day. Uh, I'm going to be talking about energy, which is a which is a big topic, and just going to cover some highlights because, as Nick mentioned, the Climate Council meeting this morning was two hours long, <laughs> so we have significantly less time and want to leave time for questions also. Um, but I, I think the key context here is the central strategy running through the whole climate action plan is to move away from fossil fuel use and the carbon pollution associated with it. And, and, and we do that by transitioning our end uses of energy um, uh, towards electrification. Um, and, and a lot of those end uses are in the buildings and transportation sector, which Kathleen will talk about in a little bit. But, but functionally, what this all means for the, for the system as a whole is that we're gonna be shifting um, all of this, you know, how we heat our homes, how we um, fuel our cars and trucks um, to electricity. And the logical next step there is that we need to serve all of that new electricity demand with clean and renewable energy. So what does Maine will wait have to say about this? Um, there are two big things. Um, and the action items in the plan related to the power sector are one, to ensure that we have that adequate and affordable clean energy supply. And two, to initiate a process to transform Maine's electric power sector. So in that first one, um, the big piece of this is, is the state's renewable portfolio standard or, or RPS. We have a 80% renewable goal in less than eight years um, by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And according to the governor's energy office, we are on track to meet those 2030 goals, um, at least with the projects that are planned through 2026. Um, but we will need more renewable projects coming online after that to hit the 2030 goal. Um, and since renewable projects take several years to build, um, we really need to keep the momentum going now and in the next few years to make sure that we're, uh, that we're ready to, to do that. Um, and so some of that progress comes from our boom in community solar projects, um, as well as some big procurements from the Public Utilities Commission of larger scale solar and wind projects, um, which I will note are bringing the absolute lowest cost energy onto the grid that is out there right now. Um, across all of New England, both providing clean energy and lowering um, wholesale power prices. Uh, another piece of the energy supply uh, 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 part of the plan talks about setting targets for offshore wind, distributed generation, and energy storage. Um, on offshore wind, we don't have a target set yet, um, but doing so was a, a, one of the draft recommend recommendations from the a state's offshore wind roadmap process, which is a big stakeholder process mapping out how we're going to develop this resource uh, responsibly here in Maine. Um, that work is, is very much live and ongoing right now. There's a big federal stakeholder meeting uh, next Thursday on offshore wind, and a, a bunch of us on this call are actually hosting an in-person press event on Wednesday morning. Um, so if you're in the Portland area on Wednesday and want to show your support for this new supply of clean energy in Maine, 
um, please please join us uh, on the uh, Eastern Prom, and I will um, uh, at 10 a.m. and I'll put a little link in the chat in case you'd like to sign up for that. Um, but on those other two pieces, on distributed generation and, and energy storage, uh, we do have targets for those that we've set as a state. Um, but there are some big challenges, um, especially with our utilities and interconnecting some of those projects. That is, plugging them into the grid and having them provide that, uh, that energy. Um, which brings me to the, that sort of second big action item, which is, which is power sector transformation. So big picture, we're in this once in a century reimagining of how the grid works. Um, going from one-way traffic from power plants to customers to a way more dynamic and networked uh, and responsive grid. And one of our recent accomplishments there is to have passed an integrated grid planning bill in the legislative session that, that just ended, LD 1959. So up until this point, grid planning was ad hoc. It didn't take into account this larger view of our state's climate and energy policies and, and didn't really look at what we needed the grid to do in the energy transition. And this new process uh, requires utilities to develop plans for our grid that are directly tied to our climate and clean energy goals and include assessments of uh, other things like equity and environmental justice. All of that is to say it's putting what main people want and what main people need at the center of our grid planning process instead of just the needs and motivations and, and, and profits of the utilities. So this is going to have big benefits and um, result in lower costs for our, our transition and really speed things up. So what's coming next? Um, there's a lot of work still to do. Um, we're far from, uh, far from the finish line on, on this. Um, one thing is we need to continue to push for more renewables. Um, we unfortunately saw a big renewable procurement bill, LD 1350, fail in the legislature this year. Um, it included the ability for the PUC to fill in procurements for uh, projects that were procured but, but didn't get built, um, which is really important given the economic turbulence that we're, uh, that we're all seeing. Um, and it included special consideration for energy storage projects and for building projects on PFAS contaminated farmland, um, which is a, a, just a really smart way to be able to um, uh, think about land use and renewable energy development. Um, and we need to continue driving towards the responsible development of offshore wind is another big, big piece of that. Um, and the second thing um, that, that's coming up is, is really diving into this integrated grid planning process um, to make sure we, we realize the, the promise that it has for enabling uh, the goals that we have in the climate action plan in electricity, but also in electrifying and reducing emissions for some of the other big sectors like buildings and transportation, which is what we are going to hear about next. So I will pass it back to you, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jack. And actually, I'm going to ask a quick question that came up in the in the Q and A because I see we're doing well on time while we have it. Toby asked, um, "How can individuals tap into solar farms?" Yeah, I'll try and um, I'll I'll try and be as brief as possible. But many of these uh, solar uh, community solar projects work as subscriptions. So. It's likely that you're getting marketing materials in, in the mail <laughs> for, to join many of these uh, projects. And, and the way that works in a, in a nutshell is the, uh, the solar project will actually provide to the grid an equivalent amount of energy that you use, um, and then will uh, essentially lower your bill, usually by about 10 or 15%. I think one of the challenges we're seeing there is that you aren't going to see those savings until those projects are actually built and they subscribe them you know, in advance of building them. And that's why this interconnection process is so important um, and making sure that we're uh, really sort of pulling back the curtains on how the utilities are, um, uh, how the utilities are uh, thinking about all of that. I could go, could go on and on into the technical details, but I, but I won't. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. And, and as Nancy put in the chat too, we will be covering this topic, Toby, on our webinar on the 26th. So uh, please, please join that. Uh, and all right, now I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen to talk about buildings and transportation. Thanks, Nick. And thanks, Jack, for, for starting us off with such a good, uh, where does our energy come from? I get to talk about how we use it. So uh, I was honored to, or I am honored to co-chair the Buildings, Infrastructure and Housing Working Group of the Maine Climate Council. So 
definitely going to talk about buildings. Transportation is a, a good and natural pair for that because those are our two most polluting sectors in Maine. Uh, we are looking forward to some new greenhouse gas emissions data coming out soon, but right now the most current data we have puts transportation at 54% of our state's greenhouse gas emissions. And buildings come in right behind that with 30% with of our emissions coming from homes and businesses. So we clearly can't hit those emissions reduction targets that Nick talked about at the very beginning of the, the webinar without serious work in these sectors. And, and the other thing that they have in common is at the highest level, the strategies are the same. We want to use less energy. So in, in buildings, that means increased efficiency, insulation, air sealing, that sort of thing. In transportation, it means driving less through all sorts of ways. Uh, so we use less energy and then we make sure that what we do use is cleaner. So you, this is where you hear electrification a lot. Maine has the, the highest reliance in the country on heating oil and, uh, and we wanna change that, right? We wanna switch to, to high efficiency heat pumps and we wanna make the, the energy that we do use cleaner. So from weatherization and public transit, to heat pumps and electric vehicles, we are making great strides in both strategies, in both sectors. That is great news for our climate goals. It's also really good news for our pocketbooks. I don't have to tell anybody on this webinar that, that gas and oil prices are shockingly high right now. Uh, and those, those high prices make this a really tough time for a lot of main families. And it is really clear that as long as we are reliant on a, our economy is reliant on fossil fuels, we're not in control. We don't have fossil fuel resources here in the state of Maine, but what we do have are vast renewable energy resources. So while we're making all these great investments and, and getting closer to our climate goals, we're also lowering our costs for Maine families and creating lots of jobs. So how are we doing? Well, in the state legislature this session, we passed a couple of really exciting bills in the buildings category. Uh, LD 2026 approved the adoption of increased appliance standards. So what that means is that the, the appliances that we buy, whether they're air purifiers or computers or, or restaurant equipment have to be more efficient in the, their use of energy and of water. That bill was sponsored by Representative Ralph Tucker of Brunswick, who is just an incredible environmental champion. He has chaired the Environment and Natural Resources Committee just wonderfully, and we're going to miss him when he, uh, he is termed out of the le legislature. We've got some other really great champs who will, who will still be with us, we hope, next session. Uh, Rebecca Millett of Cape Elizabeth sponsored LD1656 to make energy efficient, affordable housing in Maine. This is a direct recommendation that came out of the Climate Action Plan that, that we make sure that as we invest in energy efficiency, we don't leave anybody behind. So all Mainers, have access to really efficient housing. And what this bill did is it requires that by 2024, any housing project that receives funding from the Maine State Housing Authority has to meet high standards for energy efficiency and sustainability. You've probably heard some of the, the kinds of standards we're talking about. Uh, passive house, or if you've seen those little plaques when you go into a new building that says LEED on it. That's the Green Building Council's way of certifying that a building is, is really energy efficient. You may have heard about living building standards where there are green roofs and, and water capture and all of these cool things. We're gonna require some of those standards in affordable housing projects beginning in 2024. It also will require that, that those affordable housing projects use all electric equipment for heating, cooking, hot water, no more fossil fuels in affordable housing projects beginning in 2024. 
that's really cool. Uh, it will also require that those projects are what we call EV and PV ready. So maybe the, the electric vehicle chargers are installed, maybe there are solar panels on the roof, but the, the requirement is that the electric system in those buildings is ready for that, that we are building it out so it's easy to add if it's not there at the very beginning. Super exciting. Homes and, and appliances aren't the only place our buildings use, uh, use energy. We have a lot of energy intensive built up businesses in the state of Maine. And one of the things that the Climate Council's Climate Action Plan recommended was that we really get the folks who know about that industrial energy use together to think about how we can reduce uh, energy use in that sector. So, so Representative Nate Wadsworth from Hiram introduced LD 1554. It's climate change transition assistance for Maine's energy intensive buildings, I'm sorry, businesses. And it's really gonna help those businesses become more uh, efficient. There's so much more to talk about in housing, but I promised Nancy that I would leave a few of the most exciting housing bills for her to talk about. So I'm gonna stop there and talk about some of the federal funding that has been flowing to Maine. You've all probably heard about the American Rescue Plan and about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Here in Maine, the, the funding that flowed through the American Rescue Plan, which sometimes gets called ARPA, uh, was implemented through what we call the Maine Jobs and Recovery Act. And that act had $50 million for energy efficient, affordable housing. 10 million of that is gonna be used for affordable homeownership programs that requires that all new buildings, all new construction, under that program, use that all electric equipment, the EV and PV readiness, another 10 million for the rural affordable rental housing, has those same requirements, but it's for all projects, not just new construction. You know what? I reversed those. I apologize. The affordable home ownership is new construction, affordable renting. I wrote the same thing down. I've got it mixed up. Sorry. The important thing is the affordable rental housing program has a really great addition, which is every unit must have internet connection and internet access. You are all zooming in today. You know how powerful this is in, in your own lives. We certainly are all, I think, Anya and Nick, I can't tell if you're in the office or at home. I'm at home. Internet access matters affordable housing residents should have that as well. Under the Maine Jobs and Recovery Act, uh, there will be another $50 million that goes to support energy efficiency in, in the hospitality industry, in local government buildings, in schools, in uh, manufacturing, lots of really good stuff happening. The bipartisan infrastructure law allocated well, nationally, it increased funding for what's called the Weatherization Assistance Program to 10 times current funding levels. Here in Maine, that's going to mean $31 million in Weatherization Assistance Program for, to help, help Maine families save money on and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. That federal funding is really important that those federal investments are going to move the needle here in Maine and across the country, but but we're not done. Um, I actually just got back late last night from Washington DC where I was talking to our federal delegates about making sure that we pass a budget reconciliation package that includes $555 billion in investments in climate, clean energy, jobs and environmental justice. You'll be delighted to know they're also talking a lot about inflation control measures and pairing that uh, so that, that we're, we're thinking about all of the various crises we're facing together. Uh, and the good news is that these investments really work. Maine is on track to 
flow past Governor Mills's ambitious goal of installing 100,000 heat pumps by 2025 when she announced that, that goal, some of us uh, were nibbling on our fingernails a little bit. It felt like a really big ask, and we are going to be able to put a huge check mark next to it. By 2025, we've got the highest per capita heat pump penetration in the country. We are making good progress. We're also making progress on the transportation front. Uh, at the, in the legislature this year, we saw LD 1579 put lead by example goals into state law to help transition state and municipal fleets and school buses to electric vehicles. It's really cool. It's going to save us money. And don't you love the idea of your kids getting on an electric school bus in the morning? It is reality for some main communities, and it will be reality for more of us very soon. Um, those federal investments that, that have done so much or will do so much in the housing sector are also showing up in transportation. Main Jobs and Recovery Plan, which is, is how we are using that ARPA funding, is going to allocate $8 million to public EV charging, $5 million to workforce transportation pilots, and we talked about internet a second ago, but listen to this, $150 million for broadband deployment. This is going to transform living and working in Maine. And why am I saying this under transportation? Because I didn't drive anywhere this morning to get to work. <laughs> It, it makes a difference when we reduce vehicle miles traveled. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law also is allocating 47 or, or will flow $47 million for public transit in Maine. So maybe you do need to get to the office, but you don't necessarily have to take your own car. We can, we can do better on Maine transportation, on public transit in Maine. There is so much opportunity there. I could go on forever, but I should probably let other people talk on the webinar. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Nick. Ethelene, thank you so much. There is so much happening in Maine and around the country. Uh, for a lot of folks, these this is sort of the visible part of the climate change action, right? Things happening to our homes. And so it's great to know that, that so much is happening. Thank you for that update. And we're not done um, because now Nancy Smith is gonna jump in and, and fill in some of the rest, Nancy. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to follow up on Kathleen's highlights in building and transportation and also really pleased Grow Smart Maine is co-hosting this series with Maine Audubon. Before I dive into what I'm talking about, I want to follow up with Kathleen's reference to broadband. If you're not yet a member of the Maine Broadband Coalition, that's where you're going to get information on how to make sure that you and everyone in your community has this access that is essential even beyond the pandemic but as we have fundamentally changed the way that we live work and play so back to the, the conversation about um, how housing fits into this the connections between housing and climate action with smart growth principles really connecting what are often seen as siloed priorities. You heard Kathleen mention the connections between housing and transportation, economic development and environmental stewardship. These can and should all be coordinated rather than seen as competing interests. As I highlight a couple of bills and a couple of components of the supplemental and highway budgets, I do throw, do so through the lens of the four overarching themes and goals of the Maine Climate Action Plan. First, to reduce uh, Maine's greenhouse gas emissions. Second, avoiding the impact and costs of inaction, resiliency. Third, foster economic opportunities and prosperity and what that means in um, supporting good paying jobs. And finally, equity needs to be a part of what we're doing in our climate action. Now with Maine's strong environmental organizations as we're seeing here today, it allows Grow Smart to focus on the built environment and we connect the two through our program, the Maine Alliance for Smart Growth. I apologize for the dog. I thought keeping her out of the room was gonna help. I'm going to ask Nick to put into the chat a connection to um, an advocacy update that we posted on our website last week, and it's from this that I'm referring to various bills, and you can have that uh, for your own reference. And before I dive into the five housing bills I want to highlight, I want to mention three components of the supplemental and highway budget that were just passed. 
In the highway budget, there is $15 million of additional funding for transit. This has to help our carbon emissions, as you heard from, from Kathleen, and reducing our single occupancy vehicles as we get to uh, back and forth as we need to. Within the supplemental budget, there's $3 million to facilitate municipal updates for zoning and ordinances in compliance with LD 2003, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this planning capacity is critical to the sustainable outcomes for our communities and certainly touches on the resiliency goals in the Climate Action Plan. And along these same lines in supporting resiliency, there were uh, 10 positions added within the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry, the Bureau of Information Resources and Land Use Planning. This means more capacity in our organized territories for the Land Use Planning Commission, Land for Maine's Future, GIS capacity to be able to track on the ground what's happening, and the Municipal Planning Assistance Program, and more. So getting to the specific bills that I want to highlight, the big one most people have heard about is LD 2003. It's the housing bill that came from the Housing and Zoning Commission. It contains significant changes, I'm sorry, significant changes to the municipal land use rules and provides that two and a half million dollars of funding and a half million dollars for two positions for staffing and support in the Housing Opportunity Program at the Department of Economic and Community Development. I see value here in reducing carbon emissions, supporting resilient communities, and ensuring equity. There were contentious discussions in this bill about the sprawl implications of this bill, where the lines between urban and rural settings are blurred and both are weakened. But there were negotiations between the urgent goal of increasing housing options, which would call for more housing units wherever they make sense, versus only putting new housing units in designated growth areas, which would have had the best climate impact. And I believe that a proper balance was struck, and there are four highlights from that bill. One is that accessory dwelling units are now allowed by right, meaning if you follow the rules, they're allowed and you, you're not required to have a permit. Accessory dwelling units, you may know as an in-law apartment. This allows for more affordable housing within existing um, structures or, or existing uh, properties where people live. Within designated growth areas where the community wants for there to be growth and where there's public sewer and public water infrastructure, the municipalities now will need to allow up to four dwelling units, again, within the, the regulations and zoning and ordinances um, to be able to add more housing within the areas where people or the communities want growth. Even outside of the growth areas, municipalities must now allow duplexes where they allow single family housing. And finally, there is a density bonus within the designated growth areas for affordable housing. And this allows for more units within what's allowed through the land use regulations. And it incentivizes affordable housing where there is infrastructure to support it. I think this bill is also significant in, in making note of because of the outcome, but also the process and the multiple amendments to strike that balance between what we want for climate action and what we want for housing. And the balance was needed to get that majority vote to have it passed. The next bill I wanna highlight is LD201, which extends the sunset on Maine's tax credit to support the rehabilitation and use of historic buildings, which are most often in our village and city centers. The greenhouse implications are strong for this. The reuse of existing buildings with materials that are already on site have significant climate benefits for new construction. And the embedded carbon in these buildings continues to serve important climate, economic, social benefits when the buildings are brought back to life. The job creation is within the trades, that the percentage of overall costs that's in labor versus materials that are brought in from out of state are significant for these rehab buildings versus new construction. Three more bills I'll touch on quickly. LD 1694 creates the statewide land bank infrastructure to support municipal efforts to reclaim derelict and abandoned properties. The carbon emission benefits 
um, and the economic benefits are similar to LD201 in that we are using buildings that are already on site, and if they need to be demolished, continuing to have new construction within the growth areas. LD1240 has, is um, an additional study for land use regulation barriers to affordable housing and offering guidance for municipal regulation of short-term rentals, which directly compete with year-round housing, both rental and ownership. The economic and the equity benefits there, I think, are clear as we look to increase workforce housing. Finally, there are occasions where we celebrate the demise of a bill. LD 1884 would have eliminated or as amended weakened, provisions for Auburn's farmland zone, which require that any new housing be for families that earn a certain percentage of their household income from farming. The economic impact is of course, because farming is an economic driver in Maine and reducing those emissions by reducing sprawl with having additional sprawling housing growth at that direction is important as well. So as you can see, smart growth um, is about connecting and balancing all of these priorities. And I appreciate being able to share those thoughts with you all this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, so much for that. Again, a lot going on. Uh, let me speak for the panelists and I think all the attendees in, in saying, good boy, good boy or girl back there. It's not a proper Zoom unless we get some pets on there. She, um, she thinks that she's saving me from attack. So yeah, she's good at that. <laughs> What a sweetheart. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Eliza and Anya. I did wanna remind if folks have questions, uh, please type them down below in the Q&A box. And it looks like we're gonna have time to get to them. So um, without further ado, Eliza. Thanks, Nick. Happy to be here today. Um, once again, my name is Eliza Donahue. I am Director of Advocacy of Maine Audubon. And I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share progress as well as action needs on the natural and working lands elements of the Climate Action Plan. I'm really proud, proud to sit on the Natural and Working Lands Working Group of the Maine Climate Council. That's a group of folks who are experts in the field to help advise um, the elements of the Climate Action Plan and work um, in implementing the Climate Action Plan having to do with that topic area. Uh, but before I dive into kind of the successes and, and the things that need to happen in the future to progress those elements of the climate action plan, uh, I'll talk about what do we mean by natural and working lands and why are they a part of the climate plan. So natural lands are undeveloped lands that contain important wildlife habitat, for example, and are relatively free from human influence. Working lands are lands that are farmed or managed for forestry, for example. And protecting these lands from development maintains their ability to draw back carbon from the atmosphere. Maine's forests, for example, alone sequester 60% of the state's annual carbon emissions. And in addition to storing carbon, these lands provide really important co-benefits, including supporting our natural resource industries, providing clean drinking water and wildlife habitat, and helping to moderate flood, flood event, events, for example. Now, as a wildlife conservation organization, Maine Audubon has particularly focused on advancing the strategies in the Climate Action Plan that support and conserve wildlife habitat. Uh, noting that those strategies not only serve to protect biodiversity, but also help to mitigate climate impacts. So I'll start with a handful of successes on those fronts. First, um, Governor Mills' past budget included an unprecedented $40 million for the Land for Maine's Future program. Funding from this program um, has been used since 1987 to conserve natural and working lands, both forest and farm. This funding, which often draws significant federal funding into Maine, is really critical to achieving the CAP strategy that calls for increasing the total acreage of conserved lands in the state to 30% by 2030. A second big success uh, this past legislative session is uh, I worked uh, along with a few folks on this webinar today to pass a bill that increases the size of Maine's ecological reserve system. Ecological reserves are a subset of Maine's public lands that are managed or are not managed really 
specifically to protect biodiversity and the wide variety of ecosystems across the state. Increasingly, the amount of acreage, or increasing, excuse me, the amount of acreage in the system will help us achieve another CAP strategy, which is to focus conservation on high biodiversity areas. And then finally, on the success end of things, uh, the CAP calls for expanding technical assistance to help forest owners, especially owners of smaller acreages, to manage their forests to maximize carbon storage and sequestration. Uh, the recently passed supplemental budget includes additional positions at the main forest service to help provide that support to private landowners. And of course, uh, for the sake of our job security, uh, there is still work to be done. Uh, Maine Audubon worked on a bill this session that would codify a few strategies to help balance solar development and agricultural land conservation. This bill secured the votes that it needed in the House and in the Senate, but ultimately it did get funded, which means um, that bill's uh, not gonna come to fruition. That was a big disappointment, disappointment uh, but we're committed to continuing to work to achieve the climate action plan strategy of minimizing impacts on natural and working lands from renewable energy projects. Also, though the $40 million secured for the Land for Means Future program is a huge win, um, work needs to be done to spend that money, but moreover, I'm already looking ahead and many of my partners in the conservation community are already looking ahead to how to keep that funding stream flowing, perhaps by codifying a permanent funding source for mainland conservation. Um, we've got to continue if we're going to reach the 30% uh, by 2030 goal and perhaps even more than that, continue to conserve areas that are critical for biodiversity and um, avoiding habitat fragmentation, we're gonna need to continue to conserve lands. And conserve lands doesn't necessarily mean um, absolutely uh, cutting them off from human, Im human influence. A lot of the uh, funding that comes from the Land for Means Future Program actually goes to support um, conservation easements that support working forests and working farms, as I said earlier. And on that note, related to fragmenting uh, wildlife habitat, we need to uh, think about policy mechanisms to help um, avoid that fragmentation. Wildlife, whether it's fish, birds, mammals, you name it, they need to be able to move across the landscape to breed, to feed, to otherwise um, be the critters that they are. That need to move may change dramatically as our changing climate causes habitats to shift. And Maine Audubon, along with our other conservation organization partners, as named in the Climate Action Plan, are focused on thinking about how to strategically locate development to avoid creating landscape scale wildlife roadblocks. Many of the, um, the pieces of legislation that Nancy mentioned, um, and also the work that, that Grow Smart does generally, really is in line with that, thinking about how we can achieve um, some of the issues in our state having to do with housing, but then the really, the very real impacts um, that climate has and where we're locating development, that all feeds into this late, larger theme of how we can um, avoid fragmenting habitat that will likely be shifting across the landscape as our, our climate warms. So I'm going to leave it at that. Lots more to say, of course, but uh, we've got more to say and little time. Thank you, Eliza. Uh, we have one last speaker, Anya, to close it out. Sounds good. Um, all right, I'll try and be quick so we can get to as many questions as possible. Um, but so I'm gonna chat with you all a little bit about um, strategy H of the plan, which is all about engaging main people and um, communities about climate impacts and program opportunities. Um, and so two or two, maybe three um, exciting things that um, came about this last session um, was uh, first the Climate Corps Bill, which um, establishes a program similar to other AmeriCorps programs um, that will um, uh, jumpstart uh, 
uh, climate core and support hiring positions um, to help our state meet its climate mitigation goals, assist towns and neighborhoods with climate resiliency projects. Um, and most importantly to me, um, allow new generations of Mainers to serve Maine and our country and really start to work on that workforce development piece. Um, so that's exciting. And then the second um, bill I wanted to talk about briefly is the Climate Education Bill, um, LD 1902, which um, will establish a pilot program to encourage climate education in Maine public schools. Um, and this will um, fund professional development for teachers in K through 12 um, schools um, and looking at climate change in an interdisciplinary way and providing professional development on interdisciplinary climate change education. So not just for our science teachers, but for our math teachers, for our social studies teachers, every, every type of teacher, um, because as we all know, climate change is something that um, you know, it's not just related to science, but will really impact um, all of our students' lives um, in many different ways moving forward. Um, and then the bill also funds for partnerships between schools and community organizations, um, which will allow schools to get support from um, organizations like the ones that are um, on this webinar today um, in training teachers and developing curriculum. So that's really exciting. Um, and then a third thing that just might be worth touching upon is that the governor's office um, jump-started their uh, climate resiliency partnership um, this past session, which helps to uh, support local communities all over the state in climate resiliency um, projects um, through grant funding, um, which is really exciting. And I, I think I'll leave it at there. I think um, you know one thing, that I've just been thinking a lot about as um, I've been listening to my fellow panelists is, um, you know, I, I think uh, I feel a constant tension between like what's scientifically necessary and what's politically possible. And I think, um, you know, we made a lot of political progress this past session, both in the short session and the session before. Um, and I think, you know, it's so important to celebrate that um, and really, you know, take some time to feel gratitude for, for all that's been done. Um, but then, you know, we're, um, facing a new IPCC report that says, you know, we're on track for, um, for kind of worst case scenario situations. Um, you know, we're facing, um, you know, increased resistance at the federal level to climate action. And, um, and two, while the main wave plan is awesome, um, still there's holes in it and there's more that needs to be done that's then is just in the plan. So hope folks feel like excited by what they've heard today, but also want to encourage folks to get right back at it and stay involved um, in the, the climate movement that we're building in Maine, because um, the work is certainly not done. But I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, the work is not done. We have a lot to do, but but I'm proud that we're doing it. You heard a lot of actions today that were outlined in the plan that are you know, that are uh, being worked on across the spectrum, federally and state. And it takes a lot to do it. You know, not every state gets a hold of a webinar like this because they're not making the progress that we are. Um, and it takes uh, an administration and lawmakers that are willing to take on these issues. It takes folks like us on the call who are, uh, you know, willing to push the issues and help educate the public. And it takes you folks listening at home and watching and taking time out of the most beautiful day ever to, to vote and to listen and to make yourself heard and to push for climate action. Um, you know, I think when it comes down to it, you know, the question of the webinar, are we on track? I think we are on track for the climate action plan. There's a lot to do uh, and there's a lot more to do outside of the plan, but I think we're on track, which is, a, which is I'm proud to be able to say that. Um, so, Let's get to some questions. We have about eight minutes left. I know we have some hard outs, as they say, in the in the game. Um, I want to start with one question that uh, was asked earlier of of Jack. Um, Erica asked, "Former Governor LePage was against net metering, and he still is. If he becomes governor governor again and tries to repeal net metering, do you think he'll succeed? And would those who already have net metering be grandfathered in?" Jack, could you share your answer to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as I said, uh, NRCM 
was involved in, along with many, many others, was involved in fighting those efforts when they, when they came around the first time, and we would absolutely do so again. Um, I think that the um, sort of few things that may, may, few things that have changed and a few things that haven't, one, one thing that hasn't changed is solar energy has incredibly high levels of public support, um, far more than you might, might think uh, in listening to some of these pol policy conversations, oftentimes it pulls in the 90s. Um, and with the increasing urgency and visibility that we're seeing around climate impacts, um, I think uh, a frontal assault on solar is going to be difficult. Um, I think one, one example that comes to mind is that there was a bill to roll back rooftop net metering in Florida, where Governor DeSantis, who is not progressive on these issues, uh, vetoed the bill, um, citing the sort of increased costs that it would have on, on people that have gone ahead and deployed rooftop solar there. So, um, so I, I mean, I think it's certainly possible that that, that comes along. Um, we're certainly anticipating um, in, the, in the sort of political season that's upcoming, and NRCM is a is a nonprofit organization that does not engage in electoral activity at all. Um, but we're certainly anticipating attacks on um, certain clean energy technologies sort of as part of the campaign, um, whether that's offshore wind or electric vehicles or, or other things, um, despite what we know about uh, their ability to both um, have important impacts on the climate, but also on, on people's costs and exposure to volatile fossil fuel prices and on health and, and, and all the equity implications that go into all of those things too. So, Excellent. We shall Thank you, see. Jack. Um, another question uh, for Kathleen, this is from Toby. Uh, she says, I got a great rebate for installing a heat pump water heater, but none, no rebate for my home heat pump. How do we push for more rebates uh, for this and for solar panels and electric cars, et cetera? Thank you. Um, it's a great it's great to hear, Toby, that you got that that heat pump water heater rebate. Efficiency Maine does have rebates available for for air source heat pumps. So I don't know what what happened there, but I think it is really important to think about uh, making sure that we keep those those resources flowing through Efficiency Maine. And as I mentioned, our, our federal investments are a great source of that funding for the state. Also, Ernie asked about you know what what are what are some of the challenges, and I think one of the things we all can can do today and tomorrow and and the next day is to talk about the success that we've had. You know, if you have heat pumps at home and you're happy with them, let the world know. Um, there's a, a great article I'm going to drop into the chat right now, uh, and it's just the the. The headline is, heat pumps work in the cold, Americans just don't know it yet. Well, we here in Maine are perfectly positioned to change that because we can talk about cold winters. Uh, and of course, when we pair efficiency and heat pumps, we get, uh, get even more better results. Jack talked a little bit about elections in a very um, appropriate way for, for a C3 organization. Maine Conservation Voters does engage in electoral work, so I can go even further than that and say that who we elect matters. And uh, Maine Conservation Voters every year puts out a, a legislative scorecard where we will we'll identify some of the most important climate and environment bills of the legislative session and report out to you all exactly how your state representatives and state senators voted. And I would challenge you to say, if they didn't vote the right way, should they really be representing you in Augusta? <laughs> because they are the ones who will, will make those decisions about where the resources flow, what gets included in the state budget, and, and how we leverage the resources and support that we get from the federal government. So hold folks accountable for, uh, for the, the work that they do or don't do. We know where we need to go as a state, and um, we need elected leaders who will take us there. Thank you, Kathleen. And I see that Toby said that she used less than one tank of oil due to the heat pump. So if that doesn't convince you, then I don't know. I don't know what it takes. Um, only have time for I think one more, unfortunately. Um, 
Stephen had asked early in the presentation um, about food. Um, his question specifically was, is promoting a whole food plant-based diet part of the Climate Action Plan? And Anya, is food addressed in the plan at all? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I can say is that there is um, a whole strategy around um, our natural and working lands um, and you know, working on taking a, a closer look at food consumed in Maine. And there, there is a goal within that to increase the amount of food consumed in the state, um, which is now at 10% um, to 20% by 2025 and 30% by 30, 2030 through, the, through local food system development. Um, so there are our goals to, to have more local food. There's nothing in the plan about, um, you know, um, supporting one diet over the other. And that could be an example of, of you know, something that's not in the plan that, that we should push for. Um, but certainly food and, and natural and working lands is addressed within the plan. Thank you. And I see 1259 and I am proud to bring this in on time. All that information out there in an hour. I want to thank you all for attending. I want to thank Eliza and Nancy and Jack and Anya and Kathleen for joining and for all the work that you do to make these things a reality. Thank you so much. Stay tuned because we have a lot more work to do and hopefully we'll be hosting more of these in the future. Um, thanks for joining and have a great afternoon.